Welcome, my friends, to another episode of Shoot First, Ask Questions Later. Today, we are joined by my dear Rebbe, Rabbi Dr. Jacob J. Schachter. I would be lying if I didn't say that this is an episode that I have been looking forward to since the inception of the podcast itself. And uh, I'm very excited to share the Torah of my Rebbe, Rabbi J.J. Schachter, with our listeners in case somehow they have not been Zoha yet. Uh, today we'll be looking at a tshuva in Igros Moshe. Now, I generally have a rule on the podcast. I don't think I told you this one, Rebbe. I generally have a no Igros Moshe rule for my guests. The reason is not because I don't like Igros Moshe, chas v'shalom. I learned to one-on-one with Rav Tendler. It's that I find that most Rabbanim of my caliber used it as a cop-out. They just summarize an interesting tshuva, and okay, Igros Moshe is easy to do. But I have full trust in my Rebbe, Rabbi J.D. Schachter, that the reason that we're doing an Igros Moshe is because I know that we are going to get something out of it that I myself, the reader, did not get when I read it, um, when I shared it during Kinos, actually, this past year. But before we delve right in, just in case somehow you uh, have not had the pleasure of meeting Rabbi J.J. Schachter, he is a university professor of Jewish history and Jewish thought at Yeshiva University. From 2000 to 2005, he served as the dean of the Rabbi Joseph B. Salvaging Institute in Boston. And from 1981 to 2000, he served as the rabbi of the Jewish Center in Manhattan. Rabbi Schachter holds a PhD in Near Eastern Languages from Harvard University and Fun fact, he received rabbinic ordination from Masifta, uh, Masifta Torah Vadas. Um, to begin to list his accomplishments would be a fool's errand, but suffice to say, I know him as my Rebbe, as do countless rabbinim throughout the Mer America. One could uh, perhaps say he is the Rashka Bahag of Rashka Bahags, Maven Yavin, and we'll leave it at that. Um, so Rebbe, please share with us this Tshuva Vigros Moshe and let us know why you chose it. I first want to say, Rabbi Kurtz, what kind of an incredible privilege it is for me to have <clears throat> this opportunity to engage with you. Uh, you were once a student and now you're a colleague. Uh, I am so impressed with what you have achieved and continue to achieve both your Torah Shebech Sav as well as your Torah Shebaal Peh. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this very exciting endeavor. Um, I'm uh, choosing a tshuva that has intrigued me for a very long time. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work now for many years on memory, on Jewish memory, and in particular on memory of catastrophe. Uh, how does a culture, how does Jewish culture remember sad events? Regretfully, our history is suffused with sad events. Uh, Bar Hashem, that's not the only experience that we've had, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Baruch Hashem, there have been many times where not just Vayibin Soah Aron, when the Jews had to move, but when Uvenucho Yomar, when Jews were able to be at rest. But the experience of tragedy and sadness, regretfully, is something that is very central to our history. And regretfully, as we have seen, continues to be so biamenu. Uh, Elu Bizman Hazet. So this tshuva is in uh, in Yeridea, and it's in Simon uh, Nunzayin, and it's at the very end. Uh, this tshuva uh, was uh, printed after Rav Moshe passed away. It's important to realize that, uh, but it has uh, earlier sources. It was first printed in a journal called Am HaTorah of Poalei Agudas Yisrael in 1985. It was reprinted in a sefer edited by Rav Moshe Herschler called Sefer Halacha U Rifua in 1987. And then in 1996, it made its way into this uh, volume of Igros Moshe. I want to summarize the tshuva first, and then I want to offer a series of questions. Does that work, Rabbi Kurtz? Absolutely. So the issue that Rav Moshe here addresses is uh, a question as to why is it that there is no, and I'm now quoting, Yom Kavua Latinus Ulitfila to remember the Shoah. After all, it was a massive, cataclysmic, unprecedented Jewish tragedy. So why is it by now, and the tshuva, it's 
undated. So I'm assuming early 80s. I'm not really sure exactly. Uh, we know when it was printed, but don't know for sure when it was written. Um, why is it that till now, nothing has been done to establish a Yom Kavua Latinus Ulatfila? Understand, he's not addressing the issue of Yom HaShoah. He's not addressing the issue of what the Knesset decided should be a formal memorial day to commemorate the Holocaust. He's talking about Tainus and Tfilah. If, if I may, that, that precise point jumped out to me as well, which is uh, you have that classic debate between what you call the more religious Zionist community and perhaps the more Haredi community about whether to have a date of Yom HaShoah on the calendar. It, it doesn't cleanly map onto that distinction, but broadly speaking, and many of the proponents of Yom HaShoah, at least to my knowledge, aren't going the next step at advocating that it ought to be a Yom HaTainis, a fast day. So it's interesting that Ramosha takes that angle that you don't really see in the discourse so much. Well, you do find in a tshuva of Rabbi uh, Herzog, Rabbi Yitzchak Isaac Halevi Herzog, who was then the Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Eretz Yisrael, there was no Medinat Yisrael yet in uh, 1945. He addressed the shuv, a tshuva to Rav Mishkovsky, maybe we should establish a tainus mm. to commemorate the Shoah. This is in January of 1945. Wow. And he paskins that we should and we have a right to, and we have the authority to, but he says, somebody pointed out to me that the war is still going on. Mm -hmm. And and who knows, it's now January of 1945. Maybe Masha Avara Leinu, who Chevle Moshiach. Are we in a position now to establish something, Lidore Doros? Let's wait and see what's gonna happen. Maybe Moshiach is gonna come in six minutes. So there is a discussion about Tainus, but you're right, in the context of Yom HaShoah, remember, it was established by a secular body called the Israeli Knesset, <laughs> uh, and uh, that they were not at all interested in. It wasn't in their purview to talk about Phila and Tainus. Um, and um, there really was no moving that further up from Yom HaShoah to Tfila and Tainus. So this uh, tshuva of Rab Moshe, has nothing to do with Yom HaShoah. It has nothing to do with the Knesset. It has nothing to do with what's going on in Israel. And it's important to make that distinction. This is a purely halachic question. Tainus and Tfila, you'd imagine, he says, that we should have established something like that. And his answer is very clear and unambiguous. He says, well, it's a Befer Shekina. And the, mm -hmm. One of the keynotes that we say on Tisha B'Av about the Crusades, there are four keynotes that we say about the Crusades. One of them is a keynote that actually describes explicitly <clears throat> the dates on which the first Crusaders attacked the Jewish communities of Speyer, Worms, and Mainz in northwestern Germany in the Rhine Valley. And the keynote tells us that Speyer was attacked on the 8th of Iyer, Worms was attacked on the 23rd of Iyar and Rosh Chodesh Sivan. Mainz was attacked on the third day of Sivan. And then, six lines later, the author of the Kine says, wait a minute, I just told you when it happened. Why are we saying it today? Mm. Why am I mentioning it on Tisha B'Av? I mamish just told you it didn't happen today. It happened a few weeks ago, maybe even a few months ago. And he answers, and this is what's quoted by Rav Moshe, the reason why we're mentioning it today is because one does not add days of mourning. Finished. Mm -hmm. He assumes it. For some reason, it's a dover yodua. There's no footnote here. There's no reference. We don't do that. And therefore, we're going to mention it today, the Crusades on Tisha B'Av. And therefore, says Rab Moshe, Ein Lahosef. Moed Sheva Visavera, we don't add days of mourning, and we will not do that for the Holocaust as well. If I may, and uh, forgive me if Rebbe's about to get to this point, a little bit later, toward the end of this already pretty short sub tshuva, Ramosha writes, <laughs> My understanding is that there's something more theological here, that all of these different tragedies and calamities that Kali so endured all results from the fact that we were putting Gullus in the first place. So Tishabov is this day 
that we commemorate all these tragedies aren't just random data points that occur to the Jewish people, but they all really result from the initial exile after the destruction of the Second Temple. So they're all they're all categorically the same, um, theologically speaking. So that's really interesting, and I think that's a great point. And I, I think that Rav Moshe should have said that. Rav Moshe should have said that the reason why we don't add a separate day of Tainus and Fila for the Shoah is because it all comes from the Chorban. Everything belongs on Tisha B'av. The Crusades belong on Tisha B'av. Everything belongs on Tisha B'av. Right. And therefore, we are not going to do anything. But that's not what he says. Hmm. And the reason why that's not what he says is because he asks a question from a event where, in fact, a fast day separately was established. So therefore, that argument is not a fully complete because there are examples of fast days that are established for tragedies. And Lashitascha, Rabbi Kurtz, one would say, why did that happen? Everything comes from the Golos Ha'oru Chazer. Everything emerges out of the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. And therefore, we're done. There's only one day and that's it. But there were other days. And the one that he asks is from Chmelnitsky, Tach Vetat, 1648, 1649, where in 1650, after this horrific event stopped for a while, so there was a, a, a Ukrainian nationalist by the name of Bogdan Chmelnitsky who initiated a uh, revolt against the Poles in the middle of 1648. The Jews were the ones who represented the Poles to the public, so therefore the Jews were the initial victims. And Kivin Shenitim Rishos Lamashchis Lahashchis, so then he went on a rampage and a tear against the Jewish community. And then when there was a little bit of a respite, the Varar Bar Ratzot, the leading uh, communal organization that governed that area of the world, instituted a fast day. And they decided to do it on Chav Sivan, which is the day that the Chmelnitsky massacres began in June of 1648. Asks Rav Moshe, how could you tell me that in Lahosif Moedjev Visavera? I, we see we are Mosif Moedjev Visavera. And he gives two answers. First, he suggests that the Crusades were massive. If you look at the language at the beginning when he first starts his answer, that the reason why we don't have something for the Crusades, and then he throws in, the Crusades' impact was, was enormous. And the Gamba Eretz Yisrael Hargusham Harbe Yehudim. So he's positing at the beginning that the Crusades had a tremendous impact. I, mm Chmelnitsky, -hmm. answer number one, it was much more limited. It had much less of an impact. So therefore, and this is ironic, and this is the first point that I want to make, the less of an impact, the greater the reason to establish a separate mm -hmm. fast day. Right. If it's the Chorbin, if it's the Crusades, if it's the Shoah, massive, worldwide, universal, then everything is subsumed under Tisha B'av. There's a straight continuum. What makes the Chmanitsky massacres offline? Because it was less. It was less impactful. So therefore, it's not nichlal in this straightforward continuum. Right. It's very counterintuitive. And it's very counterintuitive. But that's answer number one. Answer number two is that in the case of the Chorben, in the case of the Crusades, and in the case of the Holocaust, the ruling authorities initiated the disaster. Mm -hmm. That's what they have in common. However, in the case of the Chmelnitsky massacres, it was grassroots. 
the Poles on the Rabbah, the Poles wanted to defend the Jews. They were uh, attacked by those who were from the bottom, from the riffraff. And so therefore, once again, it's not in the continuum. What demonstrates what allows for Tisha B'Av, one straight day, if it's classical Jewish tragedy. What's classical Jewish tragedy? The Goyim are out to get the Jews. The ruling authorities want to destroy the Jews. The Romans, the Babylonians, the Christians, Hitler, Yamach Shemo. So that's all of one ilk. And then everything goes on the Tisha B'Av. But here it's offline for a second reason. Namely, it wasn't initiated from the top down. It was initiated bottom up. And therefore it's not in the continuum. And therefore, again, as you pointed out before, Rabbi Kurtz, counterintuitive, not in the continuum. Oh, now we're going to have a separate fast day. Right. This, this, is a, this is an aberration from what was supposed to happen. During Gullus, it was expected that the governing authorities where we were in exile would persecute us, unfortunately. But That's interestingly, correct. finally, we're on the aberration. side of the establishment. And it's still not, it's still to our detriment. This is, you're absolutely right. That is his argument. It is an aberration. It is not the normal way of Golos behavior. Jews are not victims the way they normally are. So therefore, it's in a separate category and it has, and it has, um, and it has uh, a separate fasting. Ad kan moreinu verabeinu harav Moshe feinstein zecher tzadik levra. Can I jump in briefly? Um, I think Rosalovichik also iconically was known as one of our, you know, recent achronim, if you will. Uh, I guess you have to be a recent achron to have an opinion on on the Holocaust. Uh, who also, if I'm not mistaken, believed that everything should be consolidated into Tisha B'av. So, in what way would you say Rav Moshe's shita is unique from others who opposed adding new days? Now, I understand. As you prefaced, this isn't Yom HaShoah we're discussing, but it seems in principle the idea of consolidating everything into Tisha B'Av. Um, as you correctly point out, um, there's a huge debate as to whether the Shoah should be incorporated and subsumed under Tisha B'Av or whether it deserves a separate day of commemoration. Most famously, Yom HaShoah, and as I mentioned to you earlier, maybe even a tinus that was proposed in January of 1945. Those who were opposed to the establishment of a separate day, and we're now discussing tinus utfila, Rab Moshe is one of them and is not unique. The earliest I found was a tshuva of Rab Moshe Sternbuch, Shail oh. Suchuvas Chuvos Vehan Hagos, where he tells the story that in 1943, Actually, it was November of 1942 when the news came to the Yishuv in Israel about what was really happening in the Shoah. Until then, people had rumors, but they couldn't really believe it. But in November of 1942, there were some 50 people who somehow were able to get out of Poland and came to Israel and Mamish told people what was going on. At that point, Rav Herzog, I mentioned him earlier, was the Ashkenazi chief rabbi, went to Rav Velvel Brisker, to the Grizz, and asked the Grizz and said, I want to establish an ad hoc fast day. We should be mispalel and be mavakesh rachme shamayim nebuch for what's going on in Europe. And Rav Moshe Sternbach says that the Grizz said, absolutely not. And he quoted this kina. We do not add any days. So this kina is in the literature already a while ago as uh, arguing against establishing any fast days. Hmm. And you're right, Rabbi Soloveitchik, a nephew of the Brisker Rav, every year on Tisha B'Av, I would sit there in Boston for years on Tisha B'Av listening to the Rav. When we got to this kina, he always said, of course there should be a day of commemoration for the Holocaust, but it should be on Tisha B'Av. Mm. So here Rab Moshe is 
not unique in drawing attention to this kina, but he is one of others who use this kina as an argument to shut down the establishment of any other day of commemoration, be it Yom HaShoah, be it as the context in which he raises this, Kindness would feel. It's really fascinating methodologically also using a kina, a piece of liturgy, as a halachic proof text. Magnificent. So that was going to be my next point. Baruch oh. Shekivanti. Um, in Rab Moshe Sternbrook's Tshuva, in Tshuva Svahan Hagos, he quotes the Briskarov and he says, even though it's, I don't want to use the word only, but I'm going to use the word only a kina, and by only a kina, I mean what you meant. Namely, it has no, this is not a Shulchan Aruch. It's not a Gemara. It's not a Rambam. This is not a halachic source. It's a poetic source. It's very nice. <laughs> it says Rav Moshe Sternbuch, even though it's, quote, only a kina, for the brisker of that was enough. But your point is well taken. And that's my first I issue think, that I want to raise. And I, and I think it's probably, if I had to conjecture, it's functioning as an asmachta. Meaning, I think they would have espoused the shita anyway, but they're able to hang Excellent. their hat on So it. then what I what I want to get to at the end, if I have time, is why would they have espoused the shita anyway? Mm. So I'll, I'll I'll stop interjecting. And uh, so, so Rebbe, there's several questions that you wanted to raise. Yes. So question number one, first of all, the irony, as you pointed out before, <laughs> that, the, that the less of an impact, the more of a reason to have an, a known fast day. <clears throat> number two, since when the Apaskan based on Akina? Number three, there were separate fast days that were established besides the Chmelnitsky massacre, Chav Sivan. In 1171, everybody assumed that the Rabbeinu Tam established a fast day in, for a massacre in Blois where 31 or 33 Jews were killed. The assumption was the Rabbeinu Tam established a fast day. There's such a thing called the Tainus of Erev Shabbos Parshas Chukas when 24 wagon loads full of Sifrei Kodesh were burned in Paris, and the Yechidim Nagu Yechidim Lehisanos. So, so there is such a thing. It's not just you're going to ding zach and you're going to, what about Chav Sivan? The medieval Jewish historical experience yields a number of examples of fast days that were established. And I'm smiling only because I remember Rebbe shared that at a Yarche Kala that we had a while back. Yes. Yes, because I've been thinking about this a lot. But here's my, my starkest kasha on, on Ramosha. And the reason why I'm so fascinated by this tshuva is not only because it speaks to the issue that is so important to me, namely Jewish memory, but because it's a historical tshuva. Rav Moshe here is now moving into the space of Jewish history. Um, I have no space at all in his space in, in Piske Halacha. But now it's a little bit my my territory. Uh, and, uh, and I've uh, done a deep dive into this because let me review, there are two uh, answers that Ramosha gives. Number one, the first answer is that the Khmelnytsky massacres were more limited. The Crusades were so many communities all over Europe and in Israel and the case of the Khmelnytsky massacres was much more limited. And the second uh, answer he gives is that in the case of um, all the other Jewish tragedies, it came from top down and Chmelnitsky came from bottom up. Now, these are historical statements. This is not a Psak Halacha. This is not Lumdis. This is not a Tshuva. This is historically. And historically, both of them are problematic. Ooh. Because historically, there is no doubt that the Chmelnitsky massacres were by far more impactful than were the Crusades. Wow. The historical uh, consensus of all historians who have studied the Crusades is that um, 1648, 1649 affected many more Jews than the Crusades. The Crusader violence was highly localized. As a matter of fact, the latest number uh, estimate of Jews who were killed in the Crusades, Speyer, Worms, and Might, 3,000. Hmm. The latest historical estimate, how many Jews were killed during the Chmelnitsky massacres, 30,000. Wow. So it's not 
even close. So the historical assumption that Rav Moshe makes that the reason why there's a continuum, Churban, Crusades, Holocaust, and Chemelnitsky is offline, is because Chemelnitsky was much more limited, does not uh, stand the scrutiny of historical analysis. Number two, the second point that Rav Moshe made, and it's not a halachic point, it's a historical point. Namely, the second point is that in the case of Churban, Crusades, and Holocaust, it's the government instituted the tragedy, as you pointed out before, Rabbi Kurtz. This is standard Jewish tragedy. This is what happens. They're after us, and therefore everything of that ilk is on Tisha B'Av, as opposed to Chmelnitsky, where Chmelnitsky, Bogdan Chmelnitsky, was pushing up against the Polish authorities, and the Polish authorities, Dafka wanted to help the Jews. Turns out that that is exactly what happened during the Crusades. Kulam hoidu v'himlichu v'amru. All Crusade historians point out that the Crusades were initiated by unruly mobs, by the bottom. Oh. And in fact, proof has been proffered that both secular authorities, the kings, and the church authorities, including the Pope, not only were not involved in the Crusades, but actually opposed the Crusades. So the same a reality that Rav Moshe suggests happened during the Chmelnitsky massacres that differentiates it from the Crusades also does not bear historical scrutiny. So, so this is this is fascinating um, that Ramosha is operating on. You know, I I wouldn't say it's his fault. He wasn't a historian by training, but he's working off um, faulty data. And I guess an interesting question is: Had he been provided the data that Rebbe just shared here, I wonder if his conclusion still would have been different. Um, I think his conclusion still would have been the same, but he would not have been able to use this argument. Um, he originally, and I'm going to repeat it again, he originally pointed out as he raised the question that he built up what happened during the Crusades as part of the question in order to be able to then answer, well, the Chmelnitsky massacres were much more limited. Right. That's not historically accurate. See, what's so fascinating to me, Rabbi Kurtz, in this chuva, is Rabbi Moshe is now moving out of the realm of halacha and he's moving into history. I taught an entire course at the Israeli Graduate School of Jewish Education at Yeshiva University. Why should somebody know Jewish history? Why is it important? Vos geit mir on. My dahava hava. It's a famous phrase in the Gemara. Why do I need to know? I have to know how to pass and I not to know how to live. And one of my famous and most important examples is this tshuva. You have to know Jewish history in order to understand this tshuva. But it turns out that the tshuva is very problematic historically. Wow. So then I have two more minutes. Absolutely. So then your question is, and I'm not going to have been able to unpack this in two minutes. <laughs> the question is, so what? what's really driving this? I mean, if one removes the historical argument, which is problematic, uh, you asked extremely well. So does that mean that he would have, Taka said, you know what? Mm, maybe <laughs> Taka, we should have a separate Taina Sutfila for the Shoah. Or there was no way he was going to have a separate Taina Sutfila for the Shoah. And he used the Kina, which as you pointed out, it's not a, it's not a Rambam, it's not a Shulchan Aruch. He used a Kina to Paskin, a Halachic Shaila. The Shaila is a Halachic Shaila. Should we fast? Should we kaveya a tainus? That's like a Jewish law ritual question. Mm -hmm. The answer is, well, I'll show you a poem. <laughs> and then the problematic historical uh, tushtels. I, I, what do I know? I don't know anything. But I, I think that Rav Moshe, like Rav Moshe Sternbuch, there is a very famous letter of the Chazonish when he was asked the same question. Chazonish was asked in Simon. Letter Igros 
the Kovetz Igras of the Chazanish, number number 97, Sadi Zayin, after the Holocaust, was asked, maybe we should set aside a fast day. And he said, we, we have no right to set aside fast days. He did not quote uh, the Kina, but he said, on principle, Dor Tov Lo Hashtika, mm-hmm. we're going to be Kaveya Dvarim Ledoros? Wow. We don't have any right to do that. Wow. So there's no doubt in my mind that uh, there was never going to be a Yom Tainus Utfila for the Shoah. And uh, they hung it. They 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 used the Kina as a, as a proof text, even yeah. though I think they realize that it's problematic. Right? Moshe Sternbach pointed out in the context of the Brisker Ruff, what do what, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's very nice, you know, a Kina, but since when does a Kina? <laughs> it, it, it reminds me of, what, it what? reminds you of something else that, that, that Rebbe taught us. Um, I think it was... Please help me out here. There was a letter of Rusalvechik about uh, whether Reitz students should go to the U.S. Army to serve as chaplains. And he, you could say better than I could, but he basically said from the outset, I made up my, he said the quiet part out loud. He said, I made up my mind. Now here's my justification. Yes, like. that is correct. That is that. That is a very good sushtel. Because I think, I think, and this raises a huge, larger, much larger issue, and my time is up. Um, I think... Often, let me put it this way, Poskim have a gut feeling as to what is right and what is not right. And then they find material to justify that in a very uh, fair and legitimate way. But it's not as if they're walking in tabula rasa and say, let me see where the Makoros take me. <laughs> I'm going to call it Das Torah. Right. There is this incohate inner sense of what is correct. And I think that's exactly what was going on here. And the role that the Kina played was, let me show you a text that could be supportive of this. But even if you take away the Kina, after all, it's a quote, only a Kina. And even if you accept my critique of the historical uh, analysis, I think the conclusion would have been the same. Absolutely. And Rebbe, I really want to thank you for taking time to share this Torah with our listeners. Part of the reason, just to get meta for a moment, that I like the angle of Shaos and Shuvos is not just the interesting halachic questions that come up, but is really the historical element that needs to interface with the halacha. And this is just an excellent example of how it ought to be done. And I just, again, I really want to thank Rebbe for your time. I'm sure our listeners are going to really enjoy this episode. I thank you. And I would ask that if any of your listeners reach out to you with Ha'oros, uh, I'm very interested. I'm finishing up an article on this subject, on Rav Moshe Sternbuch, on the Briskarov, on the Chazonish, and on Rav Moshe, on Holocaust commemoration. And uh, I have time to slip in a Ha'ara or two. So, so within the next, I don't know, two weeks, oh. I'm very grateful if uh, if you... And any of your uh, listeners, uh, this, I, I feel like I'm walking on, you know, it's, 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 it's a serious issue, uh, uh, but, but Ramosha is, is, has removed himself from the world of halacha when he gives these two nafkaminas, and here's where makom lehisgadir. Thank you so much for having me, and I wish you well. Thank you so much, Rabbi.